Thing is, he was very stingy about player immersion and set up a significant rule. The players were not allowed to read the rule books. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to chase after them? Hello, friends, trace amounts of science. You know, all this talk about the Adelaide saga and tabletop horror stories made me think maybe we should go back to tabletop horror stories. RPG horror stories? I don't even remember what you call it anymore. <laughs> uh, this one was suggested to us by Mr. Rando. The elevator pitch was, if you want to get back into RPG horror stories, you might get a kick out of this one, because the man has the whole package when it comes to that, guys. Creepy roleplay, railroading, weeb shenanigans, main character syndrome, the whole shebangabang. And even at a glance, it looked like a banger, so we might as well get into it. It's only four parts. I, I move at a pretty good clip, don't I? <laughs> uh, we'll just have to see how it goes, I guess. With all that said, thanks for joining me, and let's jump into it. RPG Horror Stories by Azure Philosopher. You stole my waifu! <laughs> it's just the title alone. Mwah! Beautiful. An exercise in lack of self-awareness. This is a story from a few years back, when I still studied at university. My gaming group consisted of a mix of study mates and older friends, all aged in their early to mid-twenties. The group was great, and it still keeps together even nowadays, about eight years later. Well, except for one guy. A classic that guy, with a particular lack of self-awareness. This is the story about the many red flags that he raised and him ultimately leaving the campaign. Yeah, that's good. I like a good group of buddies. You didn't let one bad apple spoil a bunch? That's advisable. <laughs> the first big campaign that we played together used the Anima Beyond Fantasy system, a niche and kind of obscure Spanish tabletop that is basically high fantasy on super coke. Highly recommend it, we still play it. Doesn't fit my taste, I like low fantasy. You know, our good buddy, friend of the channel Ramtide made uh, Blood and Thunder, which is a low fantasy setting about pirates. There's holy magic, there's tribal magic, superstitions, uh, mysticism and skepticism, and enchantments I think is another one. But yeah, it's all stuff that could feasibly exist in real life. Nobody's shooting fireballs from their hands. You make a little voodoo talisman and slip it under somebody's pillow. Hope it doesn't backfire on you, which it often does. <laughs> you don't get something for nothing. Oh, you slept and recovered all your magic points? That's nice. You want to deal with unnatural powers? You might get some unnatural results. Anyway, Blood and Thunder, super cool as far as tabletops go. That's the one I'd recommend, and you can get it right now on ramtide.itch.io. There's also waifus and weirdos if a one-shot neckbeard adventure is more your thing. And there's also So You Wake Up Naked in a Field with a Rock, which is basically whatever you want it to be. I'm sure Ramtide would like it if you gave him money. He's having a baby soon, after all. But you don't have to. Go to his itch page, grab him if you want, tell a friend, word of mouth is valuable. And as his friend, yes, those are the words from my mouth. Thank you for the very easy plug, OP. <laughs> so, our... OP was the uh, ST, which I guess is like the GM for their Anima Beyond Fantasy game, and they had four players. Charlie played a surprisingly deep barbarian from the far north with a penchant for eating raw birds, occasional cannibalism, and hacking people to pieces with war axes. Yep, all barbarian things. <laughs> I would like to rage! Rage, please! Raging! <laughs> the second player, Jacob, rolled a hardcore survivalist and martial artist from a jungle country that acted as the grown-up in the group. Jacob was probably the greatest player in the campaign, and his character went through an amazing evolution, but that's a story for another time, and definitely another sub-forum. Thirdly was Jake, who played a circus runaway wizard psychic. Yes, that is a thing, and it is awesome. Oh well, yeah, you know, different strokes for different folks. Oh, and also, Jake did end himself in an arcane mishap. See? See what happens? You messing with powers beyond your control there. <laughs> Jake eventually re-rolled a crazy elven wizard, which was great. Anyway, the fourth player was Craig, and Craig is the focus of this story. He rolled an upbeat, chi-wielding eastern monk that dripped of shonen protagonist material. Well, at least he didn't roll a, a, a tiny Japanese girl specifically. What saga is that, Ross? Yeah, the Ballad of Ross. I don't know if it was all that weird outside of the, you know, him insisting on playing a small Japanese girl, but... 
Yeah, that part does stick out in my mind, even these few years later. Anyway, I think Craig's catchphrase was screaming, Springtime of youth! from the top of his lungs and doing an obnoxious fist pump. <laughs> Most of the time, Craig's character was fine, but along the road, Craig and his character started showing their true selves, much to the horror of the gaming group. I mean, springtime of youth, that's... Yeah, I, I guess that's a catchphrase. <laughs> sure. Already you can kind of tell Craig's a weird guy, though. Uh, the campaign started in a typical high fantasy fashion. The player characters being sold as slaves together in some remote shithole of the world. I think I even warned my players that an Elder Scrolls opening was coming, so they should prepare themselves for starting at absolute zero. Hey, you. You're finally awake. The four players were captured, along with two NPCs, that would both become integral to the overarching plot. An old former priest and a young sorceress. Now, this was the first session of the campaign, and from what I know now, this was about the first red flag that came up. Said sorceress, named Rei, was from an eastern land described in the setting as not Japan during the feudal era with magic and katanas everywhere. As a result of her upbringing, again inspired by the time period that the eastern country emulated, she was very submissive, polite, and timid. Immediately after I described her, Craig had this strange look on his face, and he immediately had his character scoot over to try helping her, <laughs> more or less ignoring the other fellow captives. Yeah, this is gonna get really weird, isn't it? You have to roleplay it out with me, GM! <laughs> no, <laughs> get out of here, go home! Get the hell out of here and stay out, you pervert! Anyway, the group managed to overthrow the crew of the slave ship and took it for themselves. The group went on loads of adventures across the seas in their stolen slaver ship, fighting big bad evil guys and chthonic horrors left and right. Things were going fine, and we had a lot of fun. Wouldn't it be hilarious if the post just ended right there? <laughs> like, yeah, that's it. It wasn't a horror story at all. He scooted next to an imaginary Japanese woman, and that was it. <laughs> Uh, okay, neat. With time, Craig's character's affection for Ray kept growing and it eventually became mutual. Romance and all that was a natural part of the campaign by design, as it encouraged proper role-playing and character growth. I would say we handled it quite well, compared to all the other horror stories that I've read here. Ray and Craig's character became intimate, which made Craig exceptionally happy. Uh, that is some sort of commitment, OP. <laughs> He's just leering at you. Hey, so would you like to go to bed, my lady? And you gotta be like, yes, Craig, help me with my bodice. <laughs> I don't like where this is going. Uh, I don't think I can do it. Now, not in my games. I don't, I don't give a fuck about that part of roleplay, okay? <laughs> Whatever. Anyway. In between games, Craig wrote all these kinds of novels about his character's affection for Ray and sent them to me. Yeah, this... <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> uh, unsuspecting of things to come, I graciously applauded his dedication to the game. Are we still role-playing? Is this for real right now? <laughs> uh, this is a mental illness working its way into his mind. That's not OP's fault. He just created a... An engaging scenario. Sometimes these things can be a little bit too engaging when someone, you know, has screws loose up there. Anyway, at one point, Ray was separated from the group for an extended period of time. Craig was expectedly upset with this. He became increasingly quiet between sessions and did all sorts of odd things in character. On the top of my head, I remember him once yelling out of character at another player that he wanted to carry an unconscious nubile girl instead of that guy. Jake, which played said character, just went, sure dude, whatever, and handed over the unconscious girl to Craig. It was as weird and awkward as it sounds. <laughs> Thank God she's unconscious and also not real. But what, may I ask, will your other not-real-girlfriend feel about it, hmm? But if Ray was there, he wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> Eventually, Ray did come back to the group and had undergone quite a radical transformation, for reasons that I won't go into here. 
Her personality, formerly submissive and timid, had become sarcastic, extroverted, and at times, quite abrasive. Yeah, there you go, kick it into full Red X mode. <laughs> this did not sit very well with Craig, and he was noticeably upset by this evolvement. After this point, two parallel stories unfolded, one in character and another out of character. Okay, so my theory here is that OP didn't want to roleplay with Craig anymore, so he, he wants to make the demure Asian woman seem less inviting. Craig is, of course, upset by the seemingly out-of-nowhere change to his once imaginary waifu, and so begins the downward spiral. Am I close? Let's see. <laughs> in character, Ray and Craig's characters just sort of grew apart. Craig's character ignored Ray, and their relationship just fizzled out by lack of mutual interest. Such things happen, that's life. Yeah, I guess, but do you keep adventuring together after that? Awkward! <laughs> uh, the more interesting story is how Craig handled this out of character. He became increasingly antagonistic toward Ray, yawned, rolled his eyes, made remarks whenever she said or did anything. I remember him saying, can't she just shut the fuck up? Out of character at one point. <laughs> Whoa, relax, dude. Take it easy, man. Cool your beans, bro. <laughs> she's she's not real. You, you realize that, right? You could throw her off a mountainside if you want. Then the group probably tries to PK you. But I don't know. Roll up another character. Come on back. Hey, I'm a different guy now. Who's that dead Japanese lady? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the group tried to ignore Craig's strange behavior the best we could. The strangeness became even more apparent since the problem with Ray's transformation was limited only to Craig. The other players found this new Ray amusing and funny and a little bit sad at the same time. In other words, her inclusion in the story was still appreciated and they thought she was a great character. But for Craig, his love turned to bitter hatred for his lost waifu. <laughs> yeah, these things do happen, I don't know. He really wanted to marry the DM's character sheet, I guess. <laughs> After some time, he decided to switch character in an effort to cut away the no doubt strange concoctions of feelings that he was still having about Ray. The imaginary character. <laughs> Still, even with the new character on the table, he couldn't even bear the sight of her. His hatred doubled when he found out that Ray had moved on from Craig's shonen hero character that had also physically left the group and had now become involved with Jake's crazy elven wizard. Now, how long did that transition take? Doesn't seem like there was even time for a rebound in there. Maybe Ray is meant for the street. <laughs> he belongs to the street. Purposes. Yeah. Purposes. Uh, out of character, Craig was incredibly angry and upset about this. We, as in Craig and myself, spent God knows how many hours talking about the issue, trying to find some way to solve it, or at least... I tried with my non-existent degree in psychology. No, he really does need a psychologist of some sort. Get this man medicated ASAP. Not even a joke. Uh, it felt like I was giving actual relationship advice to Craig, which is incredibly bizarre and a bit distressing at the same time. Well, no shit. <laughs> uh, you're not a professional. This is not something that you can handle feasibly. You gotta start stonewalling the fuck out of it. We don't talk about that anymore. That character's dead. I know you're super jealous over your Japanese waifu. But again, she's for the streets. <laughs> she is thy for thy streets. So be not wary when she must return from when she came. Craig's new character didn't last very long. Craig decided to leave the group for uh, personal reasons and not having any time to role play. After leaving the campaign, he told me that he felt personally betrayed, especially for me, quote unquote, giving away Ray to Jake. <laughs> uh, yeah, how could you do that? Uh, now you owe me a, a new imaginary woman to fantasize over. Make it now. <laughs> this is insane. At this point, I was pretty fed up with his obsessive rants, but I didn't want to antagonize him any more than necessary. 
I kind of just said, hey, I was sorry things turned out the way that they did, but that one should be careful to separate character from player. Let's just say that Craig didn't qualify for the national team of separating persona from person. To point out, there was no obstacle for Craig to continue pursuing Ray in her new and improved version. I had half expected him to get to know about the new her, but I think he felt like it was too much of a chore, as he had already won her and didn't want to be bothered doing it again. But I do digress because I can't actually say what was going on inside of his head. Well, I would like to digress here, if I may. This does seem sort of true to life, and people do change a lot throughout the time that you know them. Winning your significant other is, it's an ongoing process, okay? Just because somebody chose to be with you today doesn't mean that they're gonna choose to be with you tomorrow. All this is proof positive that Craig doesn't really see Ray as a person, he saw her as a trophy. OP obviously wanted to, to evolve past that, and Craig wasn't willing to evolve with her. Even though she's not a real person, what the fuck? <laughs> You're making me dissect the whole thing. It's not even a real thing! <laughs> anyway, uh, that was the long-winded story about my problematic player Craig leaving the campaign, which lasted for another two years before concluding in his absence. There are more stories about Craig being that guy, his ultimate meltdown that ended in him quitting the group and renouncing his friendship, his own bizarre campaigns, and many other weird tales. Tell me in the comments if you want to hear more about him. TLDR, player becomes smitten with an NPC and freaks out when said NPC undergoes radical personal changes, spirals into madness as player obsesses over NPC out of character and eventually leaves the campaign, feeling personally betrayed by the loss of his waifu. What do I have to say about all that? Sucks to suck. <laughs> If you really wanted to hold on to your waifu, why wouldn't you chase it? I guess he just liked the introverted version of her, which, you know, that's fine. We've got some memories together, but now she's an extrovert. You're really not that into it, so let it go. Like, <laughs> is it that hard to let it go? This imaginary relationship that you had in a in a tabletop game? I'm telling you, dude, I'm, I'm deeply concerned for Craig's mental health. <laughs> this is not good. This is not normal. But we gotta keep riding that train till it derails completely, so uh, let's get into part number two right now. You totally are the main character in Exercise in Lack of Self-Awareness 2. Hello everyone! Due to popular demand, I've decided to write up another story in the In Exercise in Lack of Self-Awareness series. As if that's a thing. I mean, it is a thing. You just made it a thing. Neat. <laughs> this time, it's about Craig being the ST, which is GM. What does it stand for? Comments is going to let me know. We'll fix it in the next one. <laughs> Strap yourselves in, get cozy, and prepare yourselves. In case you haven't, I suggest reading the first part. Highly recommended reading. I, I already got you, OP. Two steps ahead. So the campaign started sometime during my own anima campaign. The group consisted of illustrious Craig, Jacob, Jake, and myself. When he pitched the idea, I had never even heard of the system. Exalted, second edition by White Wolf. He made it sound like this over-the-top Greek-slash-Chinese mythology madness cocktail of awesome and laser raptors. I enjoy a good laser raptor as much as the next man, but to be honest, the system sounds confused, if anything. <laughs> what do you actually want to be? If the game doesn't know what it wants to be, then I don't know what I want to be, and I don't really want to play. You add Craig into that mix, and yeah, I double plus don't want to play. <laughs> How could any decent person say no to that? I'm not a decent person, OP. <laughs> Thing is, he was very stingy about player immersion and set up a significant rule. The players were not allowed to read the rule books. <laughs> Fuck this. Uh, how am I supposed to know what the hell I'm doing? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to chase after them? Only choice parts were open for reading, such as basic character creation and some snippets of the game systems. That's nice, we players thought, and proceeded to create our characters. We initially thought that this was some design choice to get us started on some high immersion campaign where maiden knowledge would ruin everything. Let's just say that some maiden knowledge would call out the campaign for the bullshit that it became. 
<laughs> yeah, the power of the DM screen. Or the ST screen, as the case may be. And I looked it up, it stands for Storyteller. I'm just gonna keep saying DM, though. Anyway, we rolled our characters. Strict orders were placed on us to not have any attribute or skill over three, where five is the usual maximum. And we were allowed next to no supernatural powers. For those who know the setting and system, we started as unheroic, heroic mortals that had yet to be exalted. Jake rolled a savage huntress from the southeast creation, which is an area of incredibly dense forests, coupled with badlands and all that. Her tribe had been brutally wiped out by a dark overlord named Mask of Winters, a name that meant nothing to Jake, as it was suggested by Craig. Jake's huntress' name was Taya, and she was a competent archer, survivalist, and tracker, but had incredibly bad social skills. Jacob, while having a brain aneurysm, decided to roll an ancient old blind hag with an owl familiar that acted as her eyes. <laughs> it's kind of lit, honestly. Why is Jacob out here rolling up all the best characters? <laughs> I, I want to play with Jacob. He knows how to have some fun. We all thought that the character was incredibly bad, and Jacob later admitted to, quote, temporarily succumbing to insanity while creating her. He later changed the character, but we will get to that part. Dude, Jacob, stand apart. Be your own man. Don't follow these fucking min-maxers. <laughs> you can't roll this because it has a weakness to that. Who cares? My character's terrified of water. Now we can't do the, the pirate ship boat thing. Wait, that was in the last campaign. Ah, uh, whatever. It just adds a little spice. You know what I'm saying? That's important. Like the personality changing Japanese waifu. That's spicy. Let's spice it up. <laughs> uh, all right, continuing on. OP's own character became the scum of the earth Zael. Zael? Zeal. Who cares? He was a complete fiend and probably the worst person to invite to a house party. Oh, it's party demon, whoa! <laughs> his backstory was that he belonged to the middle nobility and that his family secretly worshipped some demonic entity. As nobility of just about every type is, is wont to do, the richer you are, the stranger your proclivities get. Anyway, being the youngest child, OP's character had trouble proving his worth to his extensive collection of older brothers and sisters, whom were all objectively better than him. What he lacked in sense, he made up with sheer lunacy, as he made some fell pact with the murder demon in the family basement and killed all his closest family members and the staff at their estate. What a champ! Hey champ, that's really interesting. Next time, keep it to yourself. I don't understand why anybody would want to play a character like that. <laughs> yes, he, he's a gibbering lunatic. A murder hobo personified. Well, well super. Welcome to the team, buddy. <laughs> what the fuck? What is wrong with you people? Uh, uh, OP says, I had noticed a background, which is a category of bonuses at character creation called familiar. I had no idea where to spend my background points, so I spent the maximum possible five dots in it. See, you've already broken the rules. The rules probably are asinine, but we haven't even started yet and you're already breaking the rules. And then you're gonna be like, he's the bad guy, because he got upset about it. No, motherfucker, you, you agreed to all this. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, said familiar was a servant to the murder demon, a sleek panther that could turn into an equally dangerous and badass woman. Ziel was a real edgelord, if I'm allowed to use the local nomenclature, but the idea was that he would become a decent person and overcome his psychological problems. Craig was informed of my plan and gave me the thumbs up. Panther that turns into a lady, huh? <laughs> I don't know, man. You've been seeming sus lately. I'll tell you, birds of a feather, OP. You missed becoming Craig by like a ball hair, just so you know. Just so you know. <laughs> uh, the campaign started with our characters walking up in a secluded camp in the middle of nowhere. There were cannibals everywhere, and we three seemed to be the only recent catches. We managed to escape our bonds and started to formulate a plan to escape. Jake and OP's characters agreed that killing the ever-living shit-Jesus out of these cannibals was the prudent thing to do. 
Jake was dishonored by her tribe's standards and needed to redeem herself. OP just wanted to murder fuck everyone forever. Yeah, like I said, real, real deep and interesting character there. <laughs> Anyway, battle ensued. It quickly became clear that Craig had absolutely no idea how to run this combat system. He spent the better part of an hour doing research straight out of the rulebook. <laughs> First time playing, so it was quite understandable, but as a tip to all you new GMs, don't plan a combat encounter unless you have at least a vague idea about the rules. We players had no clue, as our access to the rule books was limited by law. Yeah, but we could still drop five points and then get our sexy panther ladies. <laughs> Don't talk about OP, you know what I'm talking about. But I do imagine this is massively frustrating. Craig, I understand being a newbie, but like, read up the night before. Run some test games with yourself, you know? Being competent really isn't that hard if you commit yourself to it. <laughs> Anyway, after an incredibly awkward combat, we ran off into the desert. I will not go into much detail about what happened, as much of it is lost to the mists of memory. I will, however, go through some more amusing and alarming details of the campaign in a looser narrative, and I hope that's fine with you guys. Yeah, sure, I'm, I'm strapped in for the ride. A mere few sessions in, we met with a runaway princess from some crumbling kingdom. It quickly became clear that she was the MacGuffin of the campaign, as Craig described her in incredible detail. Oh, God, it's just another ray, isn't it? <laughs> she was a stoic but easily flustered armored princess that was clearly superior to all the player characters in every way. Her combat ability was way higher than ours. As you remember, we were allowed a maximum of three in our attributes and skills instead of the usual five. Kara, as her name was, sort of just ordered us to help her on her incredibly vague quest. We had no idea what was going on, so some form of direction was appreciated. So we went to follow around the MacGuffin, like a bunch of trail hands. <laughs> Not the heroic heroes of dawn that we were promised to be. No, you gotta earn that part. The game has to suck for the first few sessions. <laughs> nah, it's called a power fantasy for a reason. OP continues, speaking of Heroes of the Dawn, one of the main ideas of the early parts of the campaign was that we should all exult. Now, normally mortals become exalts in specific circumstances. For instance, a scholar might become a twilight cast when she realized some fundamental truth about the world. A soldier might become a dawn cast when facing impossible odds on the battlefield, and so forth. It's basically an incredible power boost that permanently makes the character larger than life and awesome in every conceivable way. Craig had a wholly different interpretation of the act of exaltation. He did it by bits and crumbs. <laughs> yeah, just keep trailing him along. Just get through the sucky part, guys. I, I swear the game's gonna get good soon. <laughs> I don't have time for this, man. I'd rather be basically any place else at this point. All of our characters... Oh, by the way, Jacob changed character to a well-spoken sorcerer's apprentice after his crazy old lady sort of just wandered off into the desert. <laughs> yeah, the owl got caught in a sandstorm. Sad, <laughs> sad. Nobody even helps her. They're just like, where'd you go? Dude, that sucks. Good luck out in the desert, old lady. <laughs> uh, uh, the new guy's name was Geist. And he knew terrestrial sorcery at character creation while being mortal. Yeah, that was totally fair. Anyway, back to the exaltations. I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. Why is it unfair? You got, like, the, the Sex Panther, didn't you? <laughs> it's fine. It's called Sex Panther by Odeon. It's illegal in nine countries. Anyway, back to the exaltations. One by one, we started noticing subtle differences in ourselves. Doing things slightly better or doing spontaneous, miraculous feats. We, at least that I know of, had these visions of old wise masters standing on the water and all that. Instead of getting all that kaboom boom at once, as dictated by the rules that were, we were drip fed one agonizing charm at a time. 
For those who don't know what a charm is, it's essentially a magic power that allows you to do increasingly crazy things. From jumping several dozen feet straight into the air, to cutting down swaths of enemies with the speed of sunlight. No, we'll get to all those things soon, soon. But the game has to suck first, so you appreciate it later. <laughs> OP says, Craig did the drip feeding, mostly between sessions. We would all have these mini sessions where we were rewarded by a charm of his choosing, of course. We never really got any agency when it came to character progression. <laughs> Trust me, guys, I'm going to build you the best character for real. <laughs> this is so dumb. But I guess Craig's your friend at this point. You sort of sit through the bullshit. I, I do get it. At least back in the day. Not these days. I truly do not have the time. <laughs> OP's character mainly got athletics charms that allowed him to become exceptionally mobile, but he got no means of proper defense or attack. I think he never once during the campaign was at full health due to being a melee fighter without the ability to defend himself. Instead, he was just jumping around. Like a total asshole. <laughs> That's the character you rolled. Embrace it. Uh, Jake got next to nothing, while Jacob, eerily similar names, but I prefer that over the character names, got sorcery as charms. Yeah, that's totally how it works. It just became even better when a new player, Mike, joined us. He had played Exalted before, and he got to roll a full solar gasp. Mike was a bit confused by the way things were handled by Craig and told him, dude, that's totally not how exaltations work. Craig just told him to shut the fuck up and let him run his game the way he wanted. I'm convinced that homebrewing and modification of standard settings and systems is totally fine, as long as you inform your players. <laughs> yes, indeed. There's something awfully sus anyways about somebody being like, you can't see the rule book. <laughs> Craig, however, had created the perfect solution and prohibited us from knowing the truth, and thus we were unable to realize his bullshit. The big problem with the method of drip feeding was that Craig was playing favorites. Jake, whom Craig had some sort of issue with, got next to nothing. Because he stole Ray. You remember that? She might be an old flame, but it'll never die. <laughs> Jacob, on the other hand, was super busy most evenings, so he had no time to do these mini sessions for those sweet, sweet charms. Myself, on the other hand, was basically courted with invites from Craig. OP had all these sorts of adventures by himself and got to learn various plot-related information. Pro tip, don't do that. Player information should be shared, at least if it is related to the main plot. As such, OP got his character significantly more useful and powerful than his peers. Yeah, cool. Good time investment. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, Jake, and I laughed heartily after the campaign came to its abrupt end. The Jake had, like, one charm that allowed her to shoot arrows at large distances. The problem was that she couldn't shoot for shit to begin with, as all the enemies were scaled to match Jacob's sorcery. MacGuffin's epic swordsmanship and OP's idiot jumping. Speaking of MacGuffin, she was some sort of homebrew prototype solar that had her exaltation tattooed into her body. Pretty sure that's just from another anime that Craig had watched. <laughs> you guys tell me if you know which one. She was leagues above us when it came to being useful, and she solved entire situations by herself. Oh, good. In that case, I don't need to be here. Have fun playing with yourself some more, Craig. <laughs> and of course, MacGuffin was never wrong. We had, as you might remember, no idea what was going on in creation, and everything that MacGuffin said turned out to be true and correct. So, nice going, Greg. Oh, see, maybe he did do some homework. The social contract was breached because he didn't inform everybody of his homebrew idea, but... I don't know, OP put five points into a sex panther, so... <laughs> I guess everybody's even. Or maybe not even quite even, because OP played that weird murder hobo guy. Anyway, I had almost forgotten about OP's murder demon familiar. The badass panther was named Raga, and she turned out to be the most underpriced familiar ever made. 
If it wasn't enough with the overpowered MacGuffin, Raga was a total combat powerhouse and became increasingly important character to the plot. Something something, lost demon queen, something. Yeah, this is the edgelordiest of edgelords characters, <laughs> but LP's the one playing it. Something's all backwards here. She also made numerous advances on OP, to no one's surprise, MacGuffin did too. They obviously could not resist his sociopathic charm. That's right, women like bad boys. Got all these demon bitches, demon bitches on my dick. <laughs> Come here, big boy. Let me see what you're working with. Hey, stop! <laughs> <laughs> Raga even ended a boss battle by herself at one point. We were after this serial killer that made portraits out of the blood of his victims. Edgy. This is the edgiest campaign that ever edged. <laughs> we need to run it inside the goon cave. <laughs> uh, he was said to be this total badass demon-possessed mastermind. Guess what happened? Round one, Raga won initiative. Every player said, but she's not even here, and Craig said, just wait. And then Raga materialized behind the badass painter and ripped him into strips of flesh and a tasty blood mist in one attack. Really climactic. Especially bad, considering Mike, whom played the party's face, wanted to talk with the painter about what had made him so powerful. Perhaps he had some fell master that was the real threat. No, that would not do, Craig thought. Yeah, why bother questioning him? You just kill him and go on to the next guy. <laughs> That's what murder hobos do. Over time, a major problem started to become evident. OP's character had slowly become the main character of the campaign. Craig gave him exclusive, essential information, which I thought was completely nuts. He also placed these awkwardly sensualized women at his feet. <laughs> Craig even threw an I swear to God underage girl at OP's character and had me roll temperance, which governs self-control, in order to not have his way with her. <laughs> this is getting really weird. No, no thank you. I'd refuse to roll for it. Did you actually roll for it, OP? I mean, I know your character's a degenerate, <laughs> but not like this. Not like this. Thankfully, I did pass that check. <laughs> he actually rolled for it. Uh, holy God. Great, I thought. He was making a harem that no one asked for. That's, uh, that's just dandy. It went as far as Craig saying to me in private that my character was more important than the other player characters. <laughs> yeah, because you guys spend all this time together, go on little adventures together, and then he wants to try and romance you with his NPCs. The NPCs are just a shield. Peel back a couple layers and see that it's really Craig lurking back there. He wants you, OP. He wants you bad. <laughs> Would you do me? do me so hard. The ball's in your court. <laughs> OP says, I was quite distressed by this and asked him to distribute the spotlight more fairly, but my pleas fell upon deaf ears. Didn't you like it, OP? Didn't you like it even a little bit? He made you feel like a big special boy. <laughs> it's getting so weird. Okay. Uh, the campaign itself was incredibly unfocused. Completely lacking an overarching plot in favor of Craig's whim of the week. Weird things just happen one by one, some of them amusing, others less so. For example, we visited Jacob's master, who was a deranged magician that had sent him into the world in search of panties. <laughs> cool. I, uh, kind of got my own game going on over here. Uh, OP had to roll temperance to not hug that underage girl to death, which failed, turning her into a side reel exalted for some inexplicable reason. OP's character was forced into copulating with a water nymph, <laughs> which almost instantly produced a fully aged son that OP could not handle. It was a right mess, without any direction to speak of. Well, the direction is just whimsy. Welcome to Craig's game, the game of whimsy. <laughs> uh, 
Eventually, Jake started to lose interest because of this unfair treatment. He made minimum effort during sessions, and yeah, I don't blame him. His actions were mostly ignored, and he was never really encouraged or rewarded for doing things. Jacob, being a sweet angel of kindness, tried to have fun and ignore the obvious favoritism. Oh, Jake, come on. He's a busy man. This is the time that he slotted in for himself and Craig is fucking ruining it. Maybe it's time to stop being a sweet angel of kindness. Maybe it's time to be a demon of retribution. <laughs> Just my thought. Opie says, I mostly felt incredibly guilty for having become the de facto main character of the story, but I tried to shift the focus as best I could. Nope, that wouldn't do, said Craig and shifted it right back. He, he sort of gave for you for real, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the campaign ended in the most undignified way possible. It was put on permanent ice after Craig found a new tabletop RPG system to obsess over. Wow, great, what a waste of time. <laughs> His interest in Exalted had passed, and he said he had quote-unquote lost inspiration. After the campaign was over, I was told that his plan for the end game, yes, he used that term, was that Raga would return in her demon queen form with the Sword of Creation, which is a powerful global defensive system, not a physical sword, and she would kill all of the gods with it. He said that it was then up to OP, not the party, to quote-unquote, redeem her, or some bullshit like that. Yikes. <laughs> Sounds to me like Craig is sort of into your little Six Panther lady too, huh? He's like, yeah, can, can I see your character sheet? I might make a Xerox. Xerox comes out and he rubs it on his face, just like, oh, yeah. Warm copies. <laughs> <laughs> now, the moral of this story is, don't pick favorites among your players. Don't take away the agency of character progression from the players. Don't follow your whims when it comes to campaign design. Don't keep players in the dark when it comes to settings and systems. And for the love of God, don't force players to have to roll something to avoid banging underage People. Not just girls, people. <laughs> and Craig is wrong for having to make you roll it, but you're the one that ended up rolling it. I gotta I gotta put some responsibility in your lap too, OP. Where's your fucking gumption? You could have refused. <laughs> what happens if you failed the check or something? Jesus. This game's going to some really dark places. Uh TLDR storyteller slash GM obfuscates facts, has a field day on everything that's holy with the setting and system, removes player agency, and plays favorites, realizes that people don't like that sort of thing, and abruptly cancels the whole campaign. <laughs> that's merciful when you describe it that way. There are two more stories about Craig that come to mind. One of them is about a promising Pathfinder slash D&D 4th edition campaign being mismanaged into oblivion, while another is about Craig's ultimate meltdown. Tell me in the comments if you're interested in reading them. Edit part three here. Uh, but we're going to get into it another day. Now, I will say, Craig, he's absolutely a creep. But OP, I don't know. You do seem to have some sort of hand in this. I'll be interested to see how parts three and four go. I'm not going to pull punches on anybody's behavior, <laughs> including OP's. I'm sure my friends in the JRE Army wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you so much for watching, by the way. If you'd like to join the JRE Army, sign up on the Patreon or the YouTube memberships. That would be pretty cool. Then you could give me money every month, and I will continue making the videos I was probably going to make anyways. <laughs> but still, it's a good deal. No, for real, I, I would appreciate your support. If you can't do it, don't sweat it. Like, comment, subscribe on the video. That's helpful. Share it around. That's helpful. If you hated it, eh, share it around anyways. I already got the watch time, so that means I win. <laughs> I appreciate you guys watching this far for real. We'll get back into this one quite soon. And until then, friends, I want you to remember that you are loved. You are worthy. You definitely, definitely deserve it. And I shall see you in the next one. So until then, bye-bye. Uh,